Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's conference on the future of the Arab world, tumult and transformation. It's 9.34 uh, in Ottawa, and I think we should uh, start. Um, my name is Teddy Sami, and I'm the director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, also known as NIPSIA at Carleton University in Ottawa. Uh, please note that today's conference is being recorded. Uh, after uh, our keynote speaker has spoken, you will be able to ask questions. I would encourage you to use the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen to uh, ask your questions. Um, I would like to first acknowledge that the land on which the Carleton University campus is located is on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. Uh, bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue à cette quatrième conférence annuelle sur le Moyen-Orient. Cette conférence a été établie en l'honneur de Michael Bell, un éminent diplomate canadien et expert sur le Moyen-Orient. Michael Bell, whose picture you can see behind me, uh, was born in Windsor, Ontario and educated at the University of Windsor, where he earned an honors BA and a master's degree. He joined the Department of External Affairs in September 1967 and in a career that spanned more than three decades, served as ambassador to Jordan, director general for Central and Eastern Europe, ambassador to Egypt, and ambassador to Israel. Following his retirement in 2004, Michael Bell, together with Michael Molloy and John Bell, with the support of Dr. Tom Najem at the University of Windsor, established the Jerusalem All City Initiative to find a fair and sustainable plan for resolving the conflict over Jerusalem's old city. He also taught Middle East affairs at both the University of Windsor and Carleton University. Shortly before he passed away at the age of 73 in 2017, Michael Bell was awarded an honorary doctorate of law by his alma mater, the University of Windsor. Before I introduce our speaker for today's lecture, let me thank uh, the International Development Research Center for its financial support and the Faculty of Public Affairs at Carleton University. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of a Bell family represented by Linda and Caroline Bell at today's lecture. Let me also thank a few distinguished guests who are today in attendance. The Ambassador of Egypt to Canada, Mr. Abu Zaid. The Ambassador of Canada to Jordan, Mrs. Donica Potty. The Ambassador of Jordan in Ottawa, Mr. al -Katane. Retired US Ambassadors, Daniel Kurtzer and Arthur Hughes. The Ambassador of Jordan in London, Mr. Nahar. Uh, <clears throat> representatives from embassies of Israel and Jordan in Ottawa. Jean Lebel, President of IDRC. Mr. Troy Lulashnik, DG, Director General at Global Affairs Canada. And last but certainly not least, uh, let me also acknowledge the presence of Barbara Usher, who was last year's speaker and is the BBC State Department correspondent. It is now time for me to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Marwan Muhasher, who is currently Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment, where he oversees the endowment's research in Washington and Beirut on the Middle East. Dr. Muhasher served as Foreign Minister and Deputy Foreign Minister of Jordan, and his career has spanned the areas of diplomacy, development, civil society, and communications. He was also a senior fellow at Yale University in 2010-2011. Dr. Muasha has also served as Minister of Information, as an ambassador in Washington, and as Senior Vice President of External Affairs at the World Bank. He's the author of the Arab Center, The Promise of Moderation, and another book called The Second Arab Awakening and the Battle for Pluralism, both books published by Yale University Press in 2008 and 2014, respectively. So I will now turn it over to Dr. Muhasher, who will speak for about 25 minutes. And this will then be followed by, Q and, by a Q&A. Again, I would like to remind everyone to please put your questions in the Q&A box uh, so that we can then proceed with a question and answer session after uh, today's speech. So Dr. Muhasher, I will now turn things over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for very much, Sami, uh, for this introduction. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here. I want to thank Carleton University for giving me this opportunity to speak. I want to acknowledge in particular also IDRC, its able president, John LaBelle, with whom I have a very good uh, friendship, and Rula Rifai, who 
facilitated uh, uh, this uh, th this lecture as well. In fact, it was at IDRC um, ten years ago that I last saw Michael Bell. At the time, I was giving a lecture uh, at IDRC, and then I was seated next to Michael at lunch, speaking about the situation in the Arab world and the unsustainability of the status quo then. That was in early December 2010. Little did we both know that in less than a month, the Arab world would erupt, uh, and in many ways is still erupting. And I often wondered, uh, preparing for this lecture, if Michael Bell was alive today, what would he say about the Arab world? Would he regard what is going on as positive or negative or both? And how would he see the evolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict with which he was very closely involved and served, of course, as ambassador both to Jordan and to Israel? So today I would like to, in his honor, maybe attempt some answers to what is the region going through, both on domestic challenges facing the Arab world as well as on the Arab-Israeli conflict. And whatever these answers are, what we can be sure of is that the Arab world that Michael Bell knew is no more. And there is no going back. The Arab world today is vastly different from the one that existed only a short 10 years ago. And I would claim that the old Arab order, political and economic, is already dead. Authoritarian bargains, which governed most of the Arab world, in which states of the region promised their people basic services, health and education, jobs, and subsidies, in return for people having no meaningful say in running their own affairs. Those authoritarian bargains collapsed first in 2011 and then in 2014. They collapsed in 2011 when governments became too big. They could no longer offer the same quality of services. They could no longer offer people more jobs and they could no longer subsidize the major commodities that people needed. But at the same time, they still expected people to have no or little meaningful say in running their own affairs. That formula did not, was no longer working. And the Arab world starting, witnessing all these revolutions, uh, calling for better attention to good governance. And then 2014 witnessed yet another crisis that people still don't talk much about, which is the decline of oil prices starting in 2014, when oil prices went below $100 a barrel for the first time. That robbed Arab governments of a very important tool to keep social peace, which is financial resources coming because of oil. And that was true in oil producing countries, but it was also true in oil importing countries, countries which depended on oil revenues for outside outright grants, for remittances of their working uh, workers working in Gulf countries, as well as investments coming from these Gulf countries. All of that started unraveling in 2014. And then of course, COVID-19 came, not to start an economic crisis in the Arab world, but to deepen an already deep and existing political and economic crisis in the region. In the 10 years, and we are celebrating uh, maybe in, uh, in, you know, in less than a month, we are going to uh, mark the 10th year anniversary of the Arab Springs or Arab uprisings, I call them. The results have been mixed. On one hand of the spectrum, we see Tunisia a country which understood that the first order of business is to write a new social contract 
between people and their state and between the different components in society themselves. And Tunisia successfully did that. Wrote a new constitution that upheld the principle of peaceful alteration of power, that upheld the rights of women, and that showed that Islam and democracy can coexist. Tunisia is not out of the woods, of course, but they, are, they have put themselves on a track that will hopefully lead to stability and prosperity in the future. And then on the other hand of the spectrum, we see countries like Libya or Syria or Yemen, which have deteriorated into civil strife, often encouraged by outside forces, men meddling in their affairs. And then we see the rest in between, countries which have either adopted ad hoc, ad hoc reforms or went back to authoritarian rule in order to basically deny that the Arab Spring took place because of a problem of a lack of good governance that permeated across the Arab world. And this is where we find ourselves today. Most Arab systems today refuse to acknowledge that their old tools are gone that the carrot of financial resources and the stick of the fear of security services are on their way out. And that these are no longer tools that can keep social peace. There are of course new tools that can be employed and that in my view will keep social peace. These, and I will, I will talk about them now, but they, Arab governments refuse to acknowledge these. And so we find ourselves in the Arab world today in an interim period where the old order has died, but a new order is having difficulty being born. Everybody said after 2013 that the Arab Spring was over, that people did not want to face the situation of Libya, Syria, or Yemen and that therefore Arab government successfully uh, 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 were able to ride the wave and go back to business as usual. The Arab Spring was not over, of course, and it took the decline of oil prices uh, to find ourselves facing an Arab Spring 2.0 in 2019 when four more Arab states erupted. Sudan, Algeria, Iraq, and Lebanon. And in my view, we're going to see different iterations of uh, 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 uprisings taking place in the Arab world until the basic problem is solved, which is good governance, which is moving the region from over depending on oil into a more productive, uh, 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 into more productive economies. And I claim that if Arab societies from now on are to transition to prosperity and stability, and if Arab governments are to keep social peace, they need to pay attention to four major areas. One is inclusive decision making. Arab governments cannot keep their people outside the decision-making circle. The trust gap between governments and their people have never been larger, and that is shown in every uh, uh, poll that has been done in the Arab world. There's a huge trust gap. People do not trust their institutions. And there is a reason for that, because they're not part of the decision-making process. And one has to bring in forces of society, peaceful forces, of course, but forces nevertheless into the decision-making process in a more credible way if we are to maintain social peace. And the second major area is to move economic systems from patronage to productivity. Oil has done the region a lot of good it has also done the region a lot of harm. In propagating a culture of dependency, a culture of the welfare state, 
uh, that did not in any way encourage economic productivity and uh, promoted a culture of no taxation, no representation in oil producing countries. Today, if we are to face uh, 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 the economic crisis that COVID-19 has deepened, as I said, and to, to understand that 70% of the Arab world is under 30 years of age, meaning that there are huge numbers of people trying to enter the workforce. The Arab world cannot stay with 1%, 2% growth. And we're not even, of course, achieving that under COVID-19. We are in negative growth. And if you want to achieve 5 or 6 or 7% growth, the Arab world needs to promote a culture of merit, where merit becomes a very important tool rather than wasta patronage and uh, employing people just because of who they are or who their parents are. The third area that the Arab world needs to do is to focus on education and move education from rote learning to critical thinking. We are not talking here about putting computers in schools. We are not talking about building more schools. I am talking about the value system, what we are teaching our kids in order to prepare them for a changing world of increasing complexity. COVID-19 is going to be only one in a series of crises that will hit, hit the modern world. And unless our people, our, the new generation is equipped to deal with these complexities and adapt to these changing environments, we are not going to be able to achieve the kind of growth that is necessary to keep social peace. Arab governments in the past used to solve this problem by employing people in the public sector unnecessarily because they were not empl employable anywhere else. Today, the public sector cannot receive more people. They don't have the financial resources to do that anymore. But if the private sector is to take these people, then we need a new educational system that teaches people that truths are relative and not absolute, that teaches people to, to accept different points of view, that teaches people to think critically and not monolithically. And the last uh, major area that I believe the Arab world needs to look at is to understand that diversity and pluralism are sources of strength and not weaknesses in society. There's no better country than Canada uh, 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 as a model of how they have been in, you know, successful at including people from all diverse backgrounds. The Middle East is no less diverse than Canada. We have people of different faiths. We have people of different uh, ethnic origin. We have people of different political, economic, social outlooks. And we have men and women like any, everybody else. But there is, a, in, a, in a very diverse region, we have very little respect for diversity. And in many countries around the world, uh, uh, it is minorities uh, that are able to rule uh, uh, over majorities without any attention to treating people as equal citizens, regarding, regardless of their gender, of their religion, of their political outlook, uh, or social status. So if we ask ourselves, who is doing that in the Arab world? Who is employing these new tools in order to move to the future, very few people. Tunisia might be a rare example. There are others in the Arab world doing things in an ad hoc manner here and there, but there is no other Arab country that has internalized uh, the fact that the old order is dead, that the old tools cannot work anymore, and that we are only going 
not only to postpone the eruption, but to make it more violent if Arab governments do not understand that they need to give these new tools the attention that uh, they require. Let me move to the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I know Ambassador Carter is in the group and others, and some of what I say is going to be controversial. But as somebody who has come from the Oslo generation, and as somebody who has worked on a two-state solution for most of his professional career, like myself, today, I cannot but come to the realization that the Oslo paradigm is dead. That the two-state solution is dead. It is not dying. It is not under duress, in my view. It is dead. And I cannot but also come to the realization that the international community has contributed to the death of the two-state solution by giving it passive support without offering a credible plan to make it happen and thus giving Israel all the time it needed to change facts on the ground to render a two-state solution impossible. Demographically, we have moved from 1993 when the first Oslo agreement was signed and the number of settlers in the West Bank and Jerusalem were 250,000 to today where the number of settlers is 700,000, more than tripled. So a solution based on separation, which is the Oslo paradigm, is no longer, in my view, possible. And whereas the uh, uh, defeat of President Trump in the elections will at least stop the deterioration in that the Trump peace plan is dead and, and uh, you know, is no more. And where uh, the United States is not going to give Israel the green light at least to annex parts of the West Bank. And, you know, by doing that, even killing the two-state solution even more. Whereas, President Biden will probably restore aid to UNRWA, will reopen contacts with the PLO. I strongly doubt that the Biden administration is going to have the bandwidth necessary to restart a serious effort on the Arab-Israeli conflict. The last such effort took place in 2014, when John Kerry was Secretary of State and President-elect Biden was the vice president. And I remember vividly, you probably all do, when John Kerry addressed Congress in 2014 and said, we have a window of one year, maybe 18 months before the two-state solution closes. It's been six years already. And at a time when President Biden is going to have to devote most of his time to the domestic rift in the United States, to battling COVID-19, to restoring the relationship with uh, its European allies, to dealing with China, I doubt that there will be much bandwidth to restart a serious effort that is going to end with uh, the end of occupation and the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. And so I maintain that the conflict that we all worked so diligently on trying to solve, including Michael Bell, the conflict is shifting today from focusing on the shape of a solution, whether it's one state, two states, or what have you, to a rights-based approach. This is, in my view, what the international community needs to evolve towards to adopt an approach anchored in protecting the rights of all people on the ground, and in particular, Palestinians. 
that the international community should avoid policies that enable and empower Israeli extremists, settlers in particular, and that the international community should also work to get the Palestinians house in order and, 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 and end this rift uh, among Palestinian uh, institutions. Does that mean we are heading towards a one-state solution? This, this taboo that, that uh, at one time we could, no long, we could not talk about? Look, today we are in a one-state reality, whether we like it or not. Today we are in a one-state reality. It's just not a democratic reality. And the question today has become, partly because the international community has not put in place the necessary mechanisms to end the Israeli occupation and has instead chose to just passively support the slogan without making sure there are implementable mechanisms to make it happen. Partly because of that, we today find ourselves into a one-state reality. And the question has shifted from whether or not a two-state solution is going to emerge to, a, to, 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 to whether or not a one-state reality evolves into a democratic state or an apartheid state. That is the question that we are today faced with, whether we like it or not. Because if a Palestinian state is not to be established on Palestinian soil in the West Bank and Gaza, then the Palestinians are going to naturally ask for equal rights, political rights, in the areas uh, where they live. And today, inside Israel, inside the territories that Israel controls, there are, according to official Israeli statistics, 6.9 Palestinian Arabs in Israel proper, the West Bank and Gaza and Jerusalem, to 6.6 million Israeli Jews. Today, we have a plurality because the rest, we have three to 400,000 non-Jews, non-Arabs that are citizens of Israel. Today, we have a Palestinian plurality in area, areas under Israel's control. And if there is no Palestinian state today, then the Palestinians will naturally ask for equal rights. And the international community is not going to be able indefinitely to keep saying no to a Palestinian state and no to equal rights. Because that means only one thing, yes to apartheid. And no, no country in the world, including public opinion in the United States, is going to accept an apartheid state indefinitely. This is where we are today. And, and, and this is where I think the conflict is heading. To end, I'm going to uh, uh, say the following to Michael uh, Bell's soul. The winds of change in the Middle East are blowing. The transformation is going to be difficult. It's not going to be linear. It's not going to be quick. It's not going to be easy. And it's not going to result in all Arab countries the same way. Those who understand the need to employ new tools will make it. Those who will cling to the old tools that have governed the, model, the Middle East and those that insist on using 20th century tools to solve 21st century problems will do so at their own risk. But the status quo today is simply not sustainable. And the new generation in the Arab world will have to pick up the fight if it wants a better future than what their parents have left them. I have every every hope and every trust that the new generation of the Arab world is actually doing that. And uh, to quote uh, a good friend of mine, Lisa Anderson, uh, when she said, the youth of the Arab world revolted 
not against their parents, but on their behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marwan, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I can see already a number of questions that have been uh, asked in the Q&A box, so I encourage people to ask more questions. So I will take a few at a time and relay them to you. There's a couple of questions that are about the role that Canada can play uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So uh, that's something that I'm sure you may have some you know, comments to make about. So what can countries like Canada do uh, regarding this, this issue? There's a specific question about Lebanon. Uh, someone has, uh, is asking uh, the following. Hariri is back in Lebanon. The prospects of forming a new government, what do you think and what are the perspectives uh, for replacing the sectarian system in the long term? And then a third question, uh, which is um, also interesting, is this tension that exists, uh, or at least how would you see the tension that exists between Islam and liberalism? that has been going on for over 150 years. Uh, this is what the person is asking. And how does this play into the four areas that you have mentioned uh, and into the re renaissance of the Arab world? So maybe you can take these three questions first and then we'll go to the sure. next ones. Yeah. Canada has historically played a very important role in the arab israeli conflict. We all may remember that Canada was the host of the uh, multilateral talks on refugees, for example. Uh, uh, but in my own view, Canada's greatest strength, and I've been to Canada many, many times, and I'm familiar with Canadian society, Canada's greatest strength is to demonstrate to the rest of the world, and certainly to the people of the Middle East, that diversity can flourish that respect for diversity can result in stable and prosperous societies. This is, a, a, this is a lesson that the Middle East should have taught to the world because we have, you know, we are the cradle of the three uh, 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 big religions. We are uh, uh, the cradle of civilizations. We are a place where so many civilizations have let, left their, their trace and so many people of different ethnic origins have coexisted in, in peace and harmony. We should teach diversity to the world. Instead, you look at a place like Libya or Syria or Yemen or any other place in the Arab world and you can immediately see uh, uh, the lack of respect for diversity the lack of respect for women's rights. It is not acceptable in today's age to treat women as less than equal than men. It's just not acceptable. And, and, and as I said, I think Canada can teach us a lot of lessons uh, uh, there. Lebanon is a prime example of an old Arab order clinging to its old tools. I mean, again, I'm, I'm one that is very familiar with Lebanon. I went to school there and, and our regional Carnegie office is in, in Beirut. Lebanon is a very vibrant society of different cultural and religious backgrounds. Uh, but yet Lebanon suffers from a feudal system. I don't wanna even say sectarian. It is sectarian, it's also a feudal system that have uh, 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 you know, a, a strong grip on the country where corruption has mushroomed, where, uh, uh, where the system has not been unseated, neither by the October 17 revolutions in 2019, nor by the economic crisis which ensued nor by the blast in Oct on August 4. I mean, nothing is moving the leaders of the political parties into understanding that the old order cannot be sustained. And today we are still talking about how do we divide uh, uh, the, the, the government among the different societies, etc. 
the sectarian system in Lebanon is not going to be uh, dislodged anytime soon. But it, the status quo is also not going to stay as it is. I think there are already signs, uh, especially among the new generation, that they can no longer accept uh, a system which has, which has brought them to where they are today. But that is going to be a very long process, very long process in Lebanon, which might take 50 years. I do, the see, I do the, see the seeds already being planted. Civil society in Lebanon is extremely strong and civil society is finally getting rid or ridding itself of the sectarian shackles that it once had. Today you have people open, openly calling for uh, uh, a civil state that is uh, void of uh, sectarian rules. Islam and, and, and liberalism or democracy, if you want, need not, and in fact are not contradictory. If you look at several country, Muslim countries, Islamic countries, uh, uh, I can point out to Malaysia, I can point out to Indonesia, I can point out until a few years ago to Turkey, where democracy was able to coexist very peacefully and amicably with, with Islam. And now Tunisia and the Arab world, because I will admit that in the Arab world, we have not been able to show convincingly that Islam and democracy can coexist peacefully. And that is the importance of Tunisia, in my view. Tunisia has shown that it is more than possible for Islam and democracy to coexist. That Islamic and secular groups in the country were able to arrive at a social contract where no group was allowed to dominate the other groups, where no group was allowed to impose its lifestyle on the other groups, and where no group can monopolize power if it is defeated by the polls. And Tunisia has shown this repeatedly. And so to those who say Islam cannot co coexist with democracy, I point out to these examples and many others. It's how we interpret religion that is important, not religion per se, when it comes to political affairs. Okay. Thank you, Marwana. We have a number of other questions. So Ambassador Kurtz says that he basically agrees with your analysis and that Palestine and Israel must live in independent states. And one question is whether we can advance what John Kerry started in 2014. And his argument is that President Abbas can provide an answer to Biden that was not provided to President Obama and whether this is a viable first step. And I guess there's a related question from somebody else, which you partly addressed in your in your speech, which is what do you hope Biden will do differently than Trump regarding this issue? And then a third question is on the role of Turkey, um, which was once a model for the Middle East, but the, the person asking the question is saying, oh, do you consider their policies to be constructive or destructive? So why don't we take these few and then we'll go to the next ones. Uh, like Dan, uh, Ambassador Kurtzer, I uh, also believe that the best solution is a two-state solution to the conflict that would give both Palestinians and Israelis the chance to live independently and to rule over themselves. What I'm saying is that just because it is the best solution is not sufficient of a fact to make it happen because the conditions on the ground are rapidly changing. The demographics we talked about. Politically, it is clear today that the Israeli government under Mr. Netanyahu has no, has no uh, wish to end the occupation, has no wish to establish a credible Palestinian state, credible, not just any Palestinian state. And that the Israeli body politique basically has no force, critical force, to push for this two-state solution. When I was 
I was the first ambassador to Israel back in 1995. And labor had 42 members in the Knesset, 42 out of 120, all in favor of a two-state solution. I'm not counting merits and the Arab parties, etc. just labor. Today, how many labor uh, members are there in the Knesset? Three, and, and two of them are in the government. Meretz is today uh, reduced, uh, you know, from a high of 16 members to today two or three members in the Knesset also. Other than these five members, of course, not, you know, I don't want to count the Arab parties. Who today in the Israeli body politique is calling for a two-state solution, a credible two-state solution? Nobody. And if Mr. Trump was to, uh, you know, stay another four years and give Israel the green light to annex 30% of the West Bank, then forget it. What can Biden do? Again, Biden, if he wants, uh, uh, well, let me say it differently. The Bi the Biden administration, okay, it wasn't the Biden, it was the, it was the Obama Biden administration, did try, tried very, very, uh, very studiously in 2014, appointed, a, 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 you know, a Middle East envoy, uh, uh, pushed the Israelis and the Palestinians to negotiate, etc. That effort came to nothing. And today, if there is a credible plan to be able to reach a solution that would separate the two communities and establish a credible Palestinian state. I'm the first to support it. I just don't see it. Nobody has been able to come up with such a credible plan. Mr. Trump wanted uh, you know, a solution totally in Israel's favor that did not take any of the Palestinians' uh, uh, aspirations or considerations. So that, that, that's my fear is we, we keep talking about a two-state solution because we don't want to face the alternative. And when I say we, I mean the international community. Because stopping to talk about a two-state solution is going to force people to think of the other alternatives, which are all problematic, including a one-state solution. They're all problematic, so naturally, People don't want to talk about them. My proposition is, if you want a two-state solution, you better show people how to arrive at one. But if you don't have a, such a plan, then only passively supporting it is contributing to its own death. Turkey. There was a time when, you know, Turkey offered a great example of how, once again, Islam and democracy can coexist in a very nice way. And, uh, you know, the Erdogan government in its early days was able to lift Turkey economically uh, 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 in a major way and to uh, present the region with an example of how democracy can flourish uh, in, in our part of the world. That time is gone. That time is gone. Today, I view Turkey, uh, I view, Mr. not Turkey, I view Mr. Erdogan as a dictator uh, who is trying to uh, 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 put forward policies that uh, uh, are not uh, respecting pluralism in any way, shape, or form. He uh, has... Uh, gone after the freedom of the press in a major way. He has gone after his political opponents in a major way. Today, Erdogan's Turkey is not going to be a model for anyone in the region. Okay, so there's a few other questions. Maybe, I mean, I, personally, I find one that is in particular very interesting is you know, the current situation of Israel and the Gulf countries in particular, as the Gulf countries are moving in the, uh, uh, do you see them moving in the right direction in normalizing and publicizing their relationship with Israel? So that's one question. There's another question about 
again, the two-state solution and, you know, what should be the future rights of Palestinians in other states of the region if you take a rights-based approach? And then a third question, which I'm sure you'll be interested in, in, in answering or commenting on, is the implications for Jordan if the Palestine-Israeli conflict has not been solved. Do you think the Jordan option is still looming on the horizon? The agreements between Israel and Gulf countries were promoted by the Gulf countries as peace agreement. Okay. Let me remind, first of all, people that Gulf countries were not at war with Israel to have peace agreements, one. Two, if these agreements are going to further the peace process and result in a two-state solution, I'm all for them. What I'm afraid, though, is that these agreements, which were agreements done in my view totally for bilateral interests interests that had nothing to do with the peace process these are giving israel the excuse that it does not need to come to terms with the palestinians because it can forge peace agreement uh, agreements bilateral agreements with gulf countries that do not require anything from israel in terms of ending the occupation and establishing a Palestinian state. And so Israel today is under this false impression, not all Israelis, but certainly that's the impression Mr. Netanyahu wants to give, that we don't need to come to terms with the Palestinians. We are, you know, normalizing with the rest of the Arab world. And, and that is going to ignore the fact that it is the Palestinians who are living alongside the Israelis, not the Emiratis and Bahrainis. And that whether you like this fact or not, unless you come to terms with the people with whom you have a conflict with, unless you come to terms with these people, it's not going to matter whether you sign agreements with all the Arab world. That is my, my concern about these agreements. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, you know, the Saudi position, at least the official position, said it all. Saudi Arabia is for full normalization with Israel. But after a Palestinian state is established, because if we, if we don't have a Palestinian state that is established, then it, the, the whole cause of peace that we are all, you know, in pursuit of is going to be at risk. And that applies to Jordan specifically. Let me explain Jordan's position. We did not go, we did not sign a peace treaty with Israel to regain, you know, a few million cubic meters of water, to regain uh, 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 a, a few thousand kilo, square kilometers of land. That's not why we, we signed a peace treaty with Israel. We signed a peace treaty with Israel because we thought that in doing so, we are going to bury once and for all the argument among then fringe Israelis who pushed for the argument that Jordan is Palestine, that if you want a Palestinian state, one does exist and it's called Jordan. We don't need to have one in the West Bank and Gaza and Jerusalem. Today, and, and you know, a Palestinian state would have achieved that for us. A Palestinian state on Palestinian soil would have assured Israel, uh, Jordanians that the conflict is not going to be solved at their own expense. But look at the situation that Jordan sees today. Israel publicly stating that it does not want a Palestinian state on Palestinian soil, at least not a credible Palestinian state. And logic tells you that Israel also does not want a Palestinian majority in areas under its control, what I referred to earlier. Okay, so if Israel does not want a Palestinian state, and if Israel doesn't want a Palestinian majority, then what option does it have left other than to try to affect a situation where either Palestinians are driven en masse to Jordan or asking Jordan to 
administer parts of the West Bank that Israel is not interested in keeping. We used to say, I used to say, 10 or 20 years ago, I used to say, that in this time and age, driving millions of people out of their homes is not a possibility. We are not in 1948. But after the Syrian crisis, I no longer say that. 6.5 million Syrians left their homes under conditions, uh, 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 left their homes in six months. So it is not impossible for Israel either to create or make use of conditions under which we can have a mass expulsion of Palestinians. And where are they going to go? We share the longest border with the West Bank. They are going to go to Jordan. That is Jordan's fear today. And that is why Jordan today, even, if, even though it has a peace treaty with Israel, Jordan is no longer confident that Israel does not have designs on Jordanian territory and system in its refusal to uh, help establish a Palestinian state. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of questions that I think are quite interesting in terms of a broader uh, um, outlook. One is talking about the looming fragmentation of the EU and the seeming disorder of the UN uh, as major international factors affecting the Middle East. Uh, what are your views on that in terms of the prospects for peace uh, in the region? And then the second question is something that you've touched on in your, in your, in your remarks, which is the Arab Spring. Do you see any benefits that the Arab Spring brought forth? So you've talked about Tunisia, but then the question is also referring, for example, to countries like Libya, where we've seen an end to a brutal dictatorship that would not have been achieved through democratic or peaceful means. So what are your views on, on what the Arab Spring has brought to the region? Let me start with the Arab Spring, just as a diversion from the peace process, then we go back to the peace process. It's not a, look, the question cannot be, in my view, couched in uh, are there benefits or not, not benefits. The point of departure for me is that the status quo is not sustainable. That is the point of departure. And once you have people go to the street, they're not going to do that in an orderly way. No transformation process will move from street protests to institution building overnight. There has been none in history. So we shouldn't expect the region to be any different. Sometimes the question is posed. I'm not suggesting that this is the case today. Sometimes the question is posed to imply that the old order was better. But the problem is the old border was not sustainable. The old order was artificial. The old, the old order kept social peace artificially peaceful with brute force or with financial resources. Today, brute force is on the decline and financial resources are on the decline. So if it worked in the past, keeping people peaceful artificially, it's not working anymore. And no one should expect that this transformation process is going to take 10 years or 20 or even 50 years. You know, as a student of history, uh, one can appreciate that uh, when the French Revolution started in 1789, it did not result in prosperity and peace and stability overnight. And, you know, I don't need to remind people uh, they went through Napoleon, and then they went through 1848, and then they, they, it, took, it took the French and the Europeans maybe 100 years. And I hope we don't, doesn't take us 100 years. But all I'm saying is transformations take time. And you cannot, you cannot, in my view, say, because Libya and Syria and Yemen went the wrong way, you cannot say, let's bring back the, the clock and have the old systems rule again. That era is over, guys. It's over. It's, it's, it's no more. 
<laughs> and from now on, the question is not whether we go back uh, to the past, it's how we move to the future. Do we employ new tools that will keep social peace or do we insist on the old tools which brought about the Arab Spring in the first place? On, on, on the EU and, and, and the UN, I remember when I was foreign minister, uh, uh, Javier Solana, who at the time was the EU basically, you know, external relations commissioner, the secretary of state of the EU, if you want. And we were working very uh, closely on the Arab Peace Initiative, on the roadmap, etc. And Javier told me very early on you know, in, my, in my tenure, he said, listen, Marwan, don't ever expect the EU to get ahead of the United States on the peace process. We're not going to do that. So if you want us to work with you, we are more than ready, but we both have to work on the United States to change their views. But we're not going to do things independently. That was a fact then, and I think it's still a fact today. With the UN, it's the same thing. You know, how many resolutions have we, has the UN come up with? Including a resolution on a Palestinian state. Including a resolution on a Palestinian state. The problem is all these resolutions were not passed under chapter seven, which obliges the United States to take action by force if necessary to implement them. And so while the resolutions have upheld international law, they have not ended the occupation. And today we find ourselves in a situation where we are right legally on legal terms. The Palestinians you know, have, have all the legal support for their case. But in practice, things are different. And in practice, th this is my frustration with the peace process of today is the international community keeps sticking verbally, passively to supporting a two-state solution while allowing Israel to do what it wants in, uh, 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 in, 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 uh, in creating facts on the ground that would render such a, a solution impossible. Okay, so let let us let me try to choose a few more as we're we're getting closer to the end uh, that I think will be more interesting um, in terms of the uh, in terms of what is being asked. One is, uh, you know, what role for Russia or China? Uh, I think we haven't really talked about them. Uh, so how do you see them? Uh, you know, what roles do they play? Uh, um, and then there's a question about this uh, idea that public opinion is changing in the Arab world and the, that the Palestinian cause is not as important there anymore, uh, whether this is something you can comment on. And then a, a fairly straightforward question is about Mahmoud Abbas and whether you think it's time for him to go and who, who could be a possible replacement. Russia has not played a positive role in my view. Uh, in the Middle East, I would uh, uh, I would argue that Russia has, uh, uh, like the United States, you know, uh, used to support dictators in the region. Russia is today supporting uh, the biggest dictator of all in uh, in Bashar al-Assad in Syria uh, for its own interests. I understand, but I, I I don't think that Russia is playing a positive role in the region. China is attempting to uh, use its economic strength to uh, be involved in the region regardless of the politics. So their view is we don't care about the politics. We're going to talk to everybody. We're going to uh, provide support for everybody. I think that's not a sustainable policy, frankly. I don't think that anywhere, but certainly not in the Middle East, you can divorce politics and, and economics uh, in, such a, in such a way. Uh, 
Public opinion, yes, is changing in the Arab world, more so among governments than the public, okay? Uh, 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 so, I mean, I'd like to see a public poll for the Arab publics stating their view of uh, uh, the peace process, not of Arab governments, because there, there will be, and I've seen, of course, such polls, and the, 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 uh, I will take issue with the fact that public opinion is changing. Yes, it is changing among governments. It's not changing among uh, uh, people. But that is not the question to ask again, in my view. Today, the Palestinians find themselves in a region where Arabs are elsewhere, where Arab governments, at least, are not uh, uh, are not uh, uh, preoccupied with the Palestinian issue. Probably, probably, Jordan is among the very few, but for its own reasons, because it doesn't want the solution to be at its own expense. But today, Palestinians are going to have to rely mostly on themselves, not on Arab public opinion or on Arab governments. And in fact, they are. In fact, they are. If you look at Palestinian attitudes today among the new generation of Palestinians, the new generation of Palestinians is not as wedded to the two-state solution as the old generation was. Today, the new generation is talking about how to raise the cost of the occupation, how to attain their rights as, as people, how to support the BDS campaign. This is what the new generation is talking about in the West Bank and Gaza. It's not talking about a state which has, uh, you know, no Jerusalem, uh, uh, most if not all of the settlements uh, taken away, uh, no right of return, no sovereignty over its uh, airspace. No, 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 no. And what the new generation is saying, and I'm telling you this from polls, I'm not telling you, uh, you know, this is not my own Im impressions. The new generation is saying, thank you very much. That's not the solution we are interested in. What we are going to focus on today is a rights-based approach. and. Wherever that leads us, we will see. University of Maryland, two years ago, conducted a poll, very interesting poll, national poll in the United States, and asked people, if there is no two-state solution, would you support a one-state solution uh, sorry, not one state. Would you support equal rights for the Palestinians? Even if this means that Israel will cease to be a Jewish or a democratic state? That's the question. 64% of respondents said yes, they will support that. 64%. That's two years ago. Imagine what the percentage will be 10 or 15 years down the line when the Palestinians will become maybe 60% of the population. It's not up to me to say whether Abbas goes or not, okay? I mean, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to comment on this. This is up to the Palestinians, they decide. <laughs> not Marwan Ma'asher on a public, uh, <laughs> in a public forum like this. This is something up to the Palestinians to, to decide. Thank you, Marwan. Maybe we'll, I'll, I'll, I can't resist this. There's a final question that I think we, we can ask, which is Iran, which I, we haven't really talked about Iran. Yes. So what are, what are your thoughts about, you know, the role that Iran can play? The question is asking in particular whether you see a more positive role uh, for Iran. If Iran is to play a more positive role, they have to decide, are they a revolution or a country? Uh, and so far, you know, so far it's been uh, decided on the on the side of a revolution. Iran uh, has interfered in uh, uh, the region in a major way. Look at what they're doing with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Look at what they're doing. They're keeping Bashar Bashar. They're helping keep Bashar al-Assad together with the with the Russians. 
they're interfering in Iraq in a major way, uh, not to mention the other parts of the Gulf. So Iran needs to decide what it wants to be. Iran is a neighbor in the region. And you know uh, the, the, this confrontation between Arab states and Iran is to nobody's advantage. So I'm all for dialogue with Iran, but, but I'm also for Iran not interfering in the affairs of the region in the way that they have been. There's no country in the world that doesn't have interests outside its borders, but there's a way to carry out these interests without offering you know, uh, 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 outright financial and military support to uh, 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 forces uh, 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 in the region in a blatant way that 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 also needs to stop. Uh, the problem with with the Gulf states uh, uh, that the Gulf states have with Iran is that you know they're afraid of such interference, and they're afraid that Biden is going to come, and you know reinstitute the uh, the agreement with Iran on nuclear powers. I don't think the agreement was a bad one. The agreement actually did check Iran for a few years in its development of its nuclear program. What needs to happen though, is that in addition to the agreement, uh, Iran, uh, you know, uh, the United States should also look at Iranian interference in regional uh, affairs and to try to check that interference in one way or the other, rather than just going back to a good uh, agreement on nuclear policy, but an agreement that ignored the interests of other countries in the region. Okay, thank you very much for taking all these questions, Marwan. It's much appreciated. Uh, I want to thank you again uh, for being our speaker today. Um, and I would like to also thank the other members of the organizing committee, uh, Rula El Rifai and Mike Malloy, uh, for their assistance. And certainly, to, uh, the final thing I, I will say is that I really want to thank our two graduate students who have been working extremely hard behind the scenes, Emily McPhee and Hadi West, uh, for helping us organize today's event. And finally, I want to thank the staff at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. Uh, for their assistance. So once again, let me thank you, Marwan, on behalf of IDRC, on behalf of Carlton University, the School of International Affairs, and everyone in attendance. Uh, thanks for a great uh, talk, and I hope we'll get a chance to meet again in the future. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here, and have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.